Old Testament reading this morning is from uh, the book of 2 Kings, chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Now the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord. But the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. And Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what have you in your house? And she said, Your maidservant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. And then he said, Go outside, borrow vessels of all your neighbors, empty vessels and not too few. Then go in and shut the door upon yourself and your sons and pour into all these vessels. And when one is full, set it aside. So she went from him and shut the door upon herself and her sons and she poured, and she poured, they brought the vessels to her. When the vessels were full, she said to her son, Bring me another vessel. And he said to her, There is not another. Then the oil stopped flowing. In the New Testament reading is from the book of Matthew. Bear with me while I get to that. Uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. Seeing the crowds, he went upon, up upon the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for their righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men rival you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so men persecuted the prophets who were before you. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Although vacation was fun, relaxing, productive and restful. I am, and I think I speak for more too, we are glad to be back. And I'm looking forward to this new eight-week series on the Beatitudes. It's based on mostly from a book that I've been reading called Set Apart by Jennifer Kennedy Dean. So we're going to start with an introduction on this word blessed. And also, the Old Covenant versus New Covenant from God, the Law of Moses and the Covenant of Grace. In the Gospel reading, the word translated as blessed comes from the Greek word makarios, a word translating the Hebrew, which most likely most scholars believe Jesus would have used that translation in his first sermon. This word has like layers of meaning. There was a Hebrew expression that was commonly used by rabbis and sages back then, translated to, oh, the blessedness of. The word also carries the sense of congratulations and implies moving forward. Lastly, the word blessed 
was used to describe someone who had everything they needed and they were completely satisfied, content, all the time. So pulling this all together, the phrase Jesus likely used, which is translated into the English as blessed are the, implies this deep-seated joy, contentment, and happiness rooted on the inside of us, not easily altered by outside circumstances. God has always wanted us to live a blessed life. In the Ten Commandments, God's desire was for people to have particular behaviors toward God and toward one another. And if they would follow these commands, they would live under the blessing of God. When the commandments were given to the people, their initial response that we hear in Exodus is this. All the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. The law gave this standard to aspire to. The people at first agreed wholeheartedly to perform these commands, these laws. Then, of course, people being human beings, being the way they are, they, they fell short, they sinned, they turned away from God and what God wanted for their lives. Jesus came and turned things around. Jesus took the emphasis off the outward behavior and placed it within our hearts. Jesus said, Do not think I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. The difference between the old and the new covenant is not so much the content of the law, but the location of it. In the Old Covenant, the law was on the outside, rules on stone tablets that people were to do. God had proclaimed through the prophets that there would be a new covenant. In Jeremiah 31, in chapter 31, we hear, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And in Ezekiel 36, we hear, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. When Jesus came, he came to lift us up from out under the law and put us under grace. What the law was powerless to do was changing our hearts. God did this by sending his son. Apostle Paul perhaps says it best in Romans 6.14, For sin shall not be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. Grace, then, is what I believe God would call the law on the inside. What the law, what the outside law demands, grace provides. Under the rules of grace, Everything that God demands of us, God provides for us. Under the rule of grace, the law that once condemned now empowers. In John chapter 1, verses 17 and 18, it says, For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace. The unmerited favor of God. Grace. God's action on our behalf. So I want to give you a little for instance with this. The law says, you shall not murder. Grace, however, prohibits the inner attitude that would produce murder. So a person, you know, a person can use their willpower, really, to not murder someone, right? But a person cannot willpower not getting jealous or angry or greedy, the things that lead up to murder. Do you see the difference? 
The law of grace requires this inner power that God gives us. This transformative law that is on the inside. True contentment and happiness that Jesus calls blessedness comes through living because of the life of Christ within us. It's not a reward for a behavior. It's a condition of the heart. So Jesus begins his inaugural address, so to speak. Right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This sounds like an odd way to start an inspiring message, doesn't it? Poor in spirit? Poor in anything? And to top it off, the Greek word that's translated there as poor implies destitute. With no ability to provide anything for yourselves. Dependent totally on others. Jesus could have used a different Greek word for poor, which would have meant more like the working poor. You know, people going week to week, struggling but getting by. But he uses this word, which means impoverished. But what Jesus was getting at was that the kingdom of God belongs to those who recognize that they are incapable of spiritually providing for themselves. They have nothing to give that earns them entrance into the kingdom of God. We need to totally depend on God. It's foundational. This is why I think this one is first in Jesus' sermon, known as the Sermon on the Mount. Being poor in spirit is not just the way into the kingdom, but it's the way of life in the kingdom. In verse 3 of the hymn, Rock of Ages, we sang it earlier. In verse 3, the lyrics, Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. This is how we enter in the first place. We provide nothing. We are impoverished. God provides everything. Remember the children's message? I said it was for you, right? <laughs> Children, they don't feel obligated to provide their own food or clothing or shelter or how are they going to get to the doctors. They don't even, you know, it doesn't even cross their mind because it's natural for children to depend on their loved ones, on their families. Well, it's like that. But unlike children, we are so used to having to work and earn and produce and show our value and on and on that it's difficult for us to come empty-handed to the cross. Difficult for us to admit that we are needy and weak. But we need to remember that our weakness opens the door to God's strength which is beyond any strength any of us would ever have on our own. An example of this comes from that Old Testament reading that Bob read. A poverty-stricken widow shows her helplessness to the prophet Elisha. She has nothing to pray, pay the creditors, and they're going to take her two sons and put them and make them as, sell them as slaves. Elisha asks, what do you have in your house? And she says, nothing but a little oil. This is the level of poor that Jesus was talking about. Impoverished. Blessed are the poor in spirit. She had no source of supply. But once she confessed her helplessness, Alicia gave her advice to go out and collect these jars from the neighbors, empty jars from neighbors. Now she's totally dependent on a supply that has to come from others. Oil, by the way, is often used as a symbol of the spirit in scripture. So although the story may be historical, it also has a layer of spiritual meaning to it. Many empty jars were collected. 
When the oil from her little jar, she kept pouring it, it just kept pouring into the emptiness. Kept pouring and pouring. The emptiness, a little became a lot. This little oil she had. And it was only when all the vessels were filled did the oil stop flowing. Because there was no need anymore. There was no more emptiness. In the kingdom, it is a great advantage to come to God as poor in spirit. Knowing we can't do anything on our own. We can try. And we do as humans. I can do that. I want to do that. But when we don't, when we're not aligned with God and God's will for what we do and what we don't do, we struggle. The more emptiness we bring to the Lord, the more filling we will receive. In closing, on this day that we share in Holy Communion, may our helplessness and weakness be the offering that we bring. God is not waiting for us to be strong. God is waiting for us to recognize our weakness. And it's not always a comfortable thing to feel. But it is invaluable. May we be blessed as poor in spirit so that we will experience the kingdom of heaven now and into eternity. Amen.